In the beginning of the 20th century, when people started learning about matter, we realized that electricity seemed to have something to do with small particles that actually got, were conducting this power across things like wire and other kinds of conductors. People were fascinated, have always been fascinated with things like lightning and things like that. Ever since Benjamin Franklin did a thing with lightning, and even before uh, Newton and other scientists in the Middle Ages, and you can watch the video where I talk about the history of science in, the, in, the, in relationship to this chapter, it's an optional video, but you can see to that to see how electricity or understanding of electricity has progressed over the time. But either way, electricity has all, was always a mystery until finally we figured out that electrons were these tiny little negatively charged particles that were floating around causing this conductivity of electricity we're talking about. Now, today we know that the electrons are floating around in this electron cloud surrounding the positively charged nucleus of the atom. But early on, we didn't even know that there were negative and positive charges inside the atom. We did not know there was an electron cloud. And even after we discovered the negative charges, we thought there was kind of like a, a with the four models, we thought it was kind of like a pudding with all the positive particles and negative particles all jumbled together. And, or like the positive particles were the, the bulk of the pudding and then the negative charges were like sitting on the outside of it. And we talk about that in that video. But either way, now we understand there's a cloud of electrons surrounding the nucleus. But the person who came up with this was a scientist, a German scientist called Niles Bohr. Now, I want you to understand right off the bat that this is not a drawing model that he did. He actually used quantum mechanics to classify the actual location of electrons in the atom using actual statistics and also math equations that you wouldn't begin to dream of. This is a lot more complicated than you think, but what you need to know about this is that atoms have electron clouds. Now remember, within the atom, in that cloud, you can consider that cloud almost like a solid ball because the atoms will have electrons which are running so fast around the nucleus, almost at 99% of the speed of light, that they are going to be everywhere and nowhere in the atom at the same time. You see, if you try to ask an electron, where are you right now? He would say, well, am I here? But in the same split second later, it's also going to be somewhere else in the atom. So it's like uh, if you had a game of chairs and the electron could sit in every chair in every second, several times per second. And so if you ask, where is the electron right now? Well, it's in every chair. But if you try to catch it, it will never be in any one chair because by the time you point to that chair, it's already in another one, even though it's in that chair at the same time as well. It's kind of a complex idea, but it's because it's moving so fast. But even though uh, the electrons will be flowing chaotically through the nucleus like that, they will be more likely to actually stay in certain areas because they're going to try to avoid each other since they're all negatively charged and so they will space themselves out around the nucleus of the atom in layers of energy in ways to avoid each other from actually touching each other since they're all negatively charged and they will repel each other. So even as they are attracted by the nucleus which has lots of these positive charges attracting them they also repel each other and that's what creates these layers of energy that you see in the drawings of the atoms whenever you see a drawing. And that's an idea that Niles Bohr came up with, and so we call it the Bohr model of the atom. Now, I'm going to go into detail on this, but what you need to know about this is that it, the atom contains seven main energy layers or shells. Atoms in the outer shells have more energy than atoms in the lower shells, and I'll explain why in a second. And you also need to understand that each shell contains many subshells, which are also referred to or organize themselves into orbitals. And that electrons will try to stay in the lowest possible energy state that they possibly can, which we call the ground state for the atom elements. So again, remember as we talked about this, that electrons will avoid staying where other electrons already are because they're both negative and repel each other, and that they will start to stay in the lower possible energy level available, and that there's many shells with subshells which will also organize themselves into things we call orbitals. Now, there are seven shells of energy within an atom, okay? And then we call these shells K through Q. You see the atom on the right side here will have K, L, M, N, and so forth. And we can also number them in terms of energy, one, two, three, four. Now let me explain why the outer layer has more energy. You see, the, the protons are attracting these electrons towards the nucleus. Now, 
uh, at the same time, this electron is going to be flowing incredibly fast to the uh, in circles around the nucleus. So it's going to be moving forwards. And so the momentum of the atom, or the inertia of the atom, is, or the electron, sorry, is going to be pushing this electron outwards, to almost trying to escape. And so just like a planet in orbit is not sucked into whatever it's orbiting, because it's going around in circles very fast, an electron, since it's going very fast, is going to create, by inertia and, and angular momentum, a force that we call centrifugal force, which is actually going to counterbalance the electromagnetic force that's pulling it towards the nucleus, and there is going to maintain the electron in balance, moving around the nucleus. Now, it's important to know for later on, we're going to talk about this in the next video, that if you give more power to this electron, or for if you add kinetic energy to the electron, what's going to happen to it is it's going to start moving faster. And just like a car taking a curve, the faster it moves, the more energy it has, the more outwards in the curve it will actually be. If you try to do a curve and you're coming in too hot, you're going to tend to go towards the wall in a race, right? It's the same kind of concept. And so the faster the electron is moving, the more kinetic energy it has, the, the more it tends to go outwards from the nucleus. That means that the energy layers outwards from the nucleus require more energy of the electrons in order for them to be there. And since matter tends to stay in the lowest possible energy that, that you can get, you're going to have most of the electrons congregating in the available layers of the first shells. Now notice that the uranium atom would actually have many of these electrons, and so it will have all the layers, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q all the seven layers of energy and of course the electrons on the outside will be the ones which are the highest energy state possible but notice that in level K or the first level only two electrons fit notice that you have one two and that's because the first layer is so small that in order for both of those electrons to be there they almost have to be touching each other and so they're going to repel each other as much as possible so for them to be in the same quantum location, that quantum state, it's going to require them to be, to be hanging out with each other. And they don't like doing that. So they will avoid each other as much as possible. Now, those first two electrons will be in the first shell. Now, the first shell doesn't have subshells. It only has one shell, basically, or one orbital. And it will look like this. It will look like kind of like a circle, and the electrons will stay in opposite ends of the circle, one electron will be spinning upwards, the other electron will be spinning downwards, and that's why they can coexist within the same orbital, because even though they are in the same energy state, one has an up spin and the other one has a down spin, which means they're not the same, uh, acting the same in a quantum in quantum terms, and so it's not going to be in the same exact uh, quantum state because of the spin. But it's in the same location of the atom. Now, remember that at the same time, this electron can be understood as being everywhere else on the atom. But quantum physics or quantum statistics would say that it's going to be more likely to be in that location than any other location of the atom. Okay? Now, remember, this is all extra. What you need to know about this is the facts that I said in the beginning of the video. Now, on the second layer, you can put up to eight electrons. So that's what the uranium does. You see it has eight electrons. But just like this first layer, the first orbital or sublayer that it's going to have, or the subshell, can only take two electrons. It's going to be another one of those circular S orbitals or S shells. And it will take two electrons. So it will go one, two electrons. And remember that is not the drawing is not showing you, but it's going to have a little subshell like that. So you put the first two over there, and then you put the second two over here. And now okay. Now, if I, it has more electrons, so it's got to keep going. But that first subshell is full. That orbital cannot take anyone anymore. It's got two electrons, one spinning upwards, one spinning downwards. That's it. I can't put anybody else there. But the second layer will have a second subshell. We call it the P subshell. Now, the P subshell will look like that. It actually will have uh, three orbitals in that subshell. You see that? And it will basically, this is one of the orbitals, and then you're going to have another one of the orbitals, and you're going to have another one of the orbitals. And just like the S orbital, each one of the P orbitals can have two electrons inside of them. And that's because one will be spinning upwards, the other one will be spinning downwards, and so forth. And that's, again, where the electron is most likely to be at. But since you have three uh, of these orbitals within the P subshell, you're going to have 
six total electrons that can fit there. So I put six electrons in the P-shell, and now I have a total of two plus eight. So I, I, I already have a total of ten electrons placed. But I gotta keep going because I gotta put 92 electrons there. So I'm gonna go into the next level. Now remember, level two only has two sublevels. That's easy to remember. Level two, two sublevels. When you get to level three, by the way, let's put the electrons that we, we put in the P shell over there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, then you're going to get to level three. Now, just like level one and two, it will start with an S orbital that has that circular shape. Okay? By the way, notice how level two, it will kind of look like this because it will combine the S shell and the P shell. So you see how it has two subshells. And that's how the orbitals of the second layer will look like. All right? Now, on the level three subshell, again, you're going to start with the subshell S, which will take two electrons. So there you go. On the next layer, I put that first two electrons over there. Then, just like before, I will have three P subshells on the third energy level. And I'm going to put them there as well. But notice that I'm going in diagonal here. Now, since I ran out, I go to the next diagonal. And now, just like before, I can put up to six electrons there. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. So, I have six electrons now. Now, this particular layer can actually fit 18 total electrons. And I only put... 8, which means the deep orbitals will fit another 10 electrons inside of them. And it will basically have 5 orbitals in shapes like these. Each of the 5 orbitals, one will be just the circle in the middle, plus 1, so then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 with a circle in the middle. That's how the D shell looks like. So if you look at the third level, you have to combine whatever this picture is like plus whatever that picture is like, and that's how the third level looks like. All right? And then it will have five orbitals in each orbital with two electrons, one up, one down on, on spin. And there you go. You're going to put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, I put a total of 18 more. I've already put 28 electrons. You know, you can continue going from here. And I'm going to stop here because you get the idea. Now, from, from this point on, you're going to if you were to continue to add electrons, you follow the same rule. You're always going to assume the lowest energy level available. So you're going to start over here. Once that one is full, you move to this one. It takes two. When this one is full, you move to this one, which takes six. Then you start on the lower level. You take two, and then you take six. But before you fill this one out, you go to this level, which has a lower energy than the 3D level up there. So then you're going to go here and put another two. Once those two are full, then you move to the 3D, and you actually make uh, put 10 over there. All right? Now, the only reason that when I was doing uranium, I didn't go to the 3D first is because um, uh, it's going to have so many more that it's definitely going to fill out all the available 4S. And so it's, it was going to go to 3D anyways. Okay? Then after you fill the 4S, you call the 3D, you're going to fill the 4P, which just like the 3P, will take 6 electrons. And then you see, you move to the 5S, put another 2. And that's, if that's still not enough, you move up here to the 4D, which can fit another 10. If that's still not enough, you go to the 5P, which can fit another 6. If that's not enough, you go to the 7 or the 6S, which can fit another 2. And if that's not enough, you go back to level 4 and you do the F orbitals, which I didn't even get in detail there. But on the F orbitals, or the F subshell, you can fit 14 electrons. It will have 7 orbitals in there. Okay? And, but that's, that's not enough, you're going to go to 5D and put another 10. If that's not enough, you go to 6P, put another 6. And if that's not enough, you go to 7 and put another 2. If that's not enough, you start with the 5F, put another 14. Then 10, then 6, and so forth. But this is currently the maximum that we know of a stable atom. And so there are no known atoms which actually occupy these actual layers or states. And so these are not normally occupied by electrons unless something happens that gives energy to the electron and then it will jump to one of these upper layers. And that's what we have to talk about in the next video. And I'll see you guys then.